Call this meeting to order. This is the regular school board meeting of the Northfield Public Schools. It is Monday, January 27th, 7 p.m. Dr. Richardson, there were a few items in our table file. Yes, if uh, you take a look at the table file, there's going to be information on the te Transformational Technology Initiative update, which includes the handout to the PowerPoint presentation, and also some information on a proposal that we have for you to consider as far as a director of technology position. Uh, also is some additional information on the calendars because now that we have a significant number of school districts in our state that as of tomorrow will already have had four days off from school before the end of January. Um, while we think the calendars we have proposed to you will give us enough um, in terms of makeup time, uh, we really want to take a hard look at if we end up with significant snow or other things going on in the next several months, mm -hmm. how we might try to address that both for the 2014-15 calendar and the 2013-14 calendar. And we also have, a, have uh, several personnel items for your review. If there's no objection, we will add these to the agenda as we move forward. All right. Public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address the board. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board? All right. With that, we will move on to approval of the minutes. Board members, you have in your packets um, two sets of minutes from the last um, school board meeting. We have our organizational school board me meeting minutes from January 13th, as well as the um, regular school board minutes from January 13th. Is there a motion to approve these minutes? Moved by Carrie. Second. Seconded by Ann. We're going to do them together. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving both the organizational school board minutes and the regular school board minutes from January 13th say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Announcements and recognition. Okay. I have several this evening. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Bubba Sullivan. He was recently selected as the Minnesota High School Football Power of Influence Award winner by the Minnesota Football Coaches Association for this year. Along with being the Minnesota winner, Bubba will be considered for the National Power of Influence Award. The American Football Coaches Association, American Football Coaches Foundation take great pride in nationally recognizing a high school football head coach who for their lifetime has had a powerful influence on staff, players, and his community. So we'll see how that goes, but again, congratulations to Bubba. On January 10th, we had 48 of our DECA students who competed at the district competition in St. Paul. 24 of those students will be competing in the DECA state competition, which runs from March 2nd through 4th in Minneapolis. Special recognition goes to Bennett Falk, uh, Ethan Nelson, and Jenna Shepard, who qualified in three events each. Uh, this is the first for our Northfield High School DECA program. So uh, that group in just a very few short years has really <coughs> create a great reputation for themselves in terms of the work that they do. Our high school music listening team will advance the state competition on February the 7th at Augsburg College after winning first place at the Region 2 competition last Friday. The winning team consists of Henry Beamers, William Beamers, and Nicholas Pelletier. Nine teams competed from Northfield, Edina, Farmington, and Owatonna. The coach, Karen Madsen, and the team are excited to defend their state championship from last year. Also, the Human Rights Commission hosted a very moving program honoring Martin Luther King Jr. at St. Dominic Church. Bridgewater Principal Nancy Antoine was the MC for the event, and she did an excellent job. Uh, the late Sharon Gates Hall received this year's Human Rights Award. Other highlights of the evening included essays written by members of the Union of Youth, music by Northfield Youth Choirs, and a presentation of this year's Latino Play Festival. And then the last item, and have Ann do because <laughs> Ann was there and I unfortunately was unable able to be there last okay, week. And Julie was there with me. Okay. Um, we attended the high school service learning uh, presentation and um, they're always great, but this year I think Julie, you agree with me that they were much more um, 
I guess mature in what they did. That they, their all their projects were amazing and very helpful to the community. Um, some of the some of the things that we saw were uh, emergency kits for immigrants, um, healthy habits, one of the topics, um, helping with youth sports and kindness retreats, things like that, upcycling cell phones, and um, ramp up for Larry, which uh, some of you mm -hmm. probably heard about. And also um, some safety things like not texting while driving and using fly. So it was a it was a really great program in Sarasota. All right, any other announcements or recognition? All right, we are ready to move on to our first item, which I believe is Matt Hillman talking about the Transformational Technology Initiative update. Yes, yes, it's tonight too, always good. For those of you who know me, I'm setting a timer for myself here, so you'll be happy about that. So we just, uh, we just finished the first semester, of course, last week, and so we thought it'd be a good opportunity to give you a mid-year transformational technology update. I'm just gonna give you a, a high-level overview, and then we have the stars of the show, Carl Wieselman and Paul Eddy, who have really um, been responsible for putting the vision that we shared with you last year into true action, and uh, they've got some real from the front lines kind of stories for you that they're gonna share. They've produced a video. We're gonna show that to you in just a few minutes. So just to remind you what we had worked with, um, at the secondary level, we have produced, we put out to, uh, just about 2,280 iPad 2 tablets in a one-to-one -one initiative. We did about 500 iPad mini tablets. Tonight's presentation is mostly about the one-to-one -one at the secondary, but we will talk with you in the coming months about how it's impacting the elementary, because we're seeing some really great things there in the pod approach, especially in conjunction with RTI. As you know, we had the self-insurance strategy and with a sliding scale of $25 for students who uh, pay full price for lunch, $20 for students who pay partial price for lunch, and $15 for those who pay uh, who are free lunch participants. We collected just more than $50,000 from that self-insurance strategy and hold on to that number for a few moments. As you know, we talked a lot last spring about the SAMR model, and that has really guided our training, not only our 13 session, 13 Tuesdays tech boot camp in the summer, but also the ongoing training that we've had throughout the school year and after school fashion um, at both the middle school and the high school. We also had some technology training at the high school all day last Monday where participants could work in up to four different hour and 15 minute breakout sessions. Um, so that was really great. And if you remember, we had the four year implementation plan tackling one SAMR level per year. So what has been going well so far? Uh, what's been going relatively well, we think that where we're at, the SAMR model is doing exactly what we wanted it to do. We have a number of people, Paul and uh, Carl here, who have blown the doors off and have gone to redefinition right away. We have other folks who are working within their different courses to see is how does substitution play in this particular area. Really, um, one thing that transcending substitution is the final bullet here. And I really think we've gotten augmentation for the price of substitution in a lot of areas because most of the substituting we had been doing, we had been doing before with regular computing devices. And when they've moved it to the iPad or where every student has their own device, we've seen a number of things where it is better than what the original task was. It's just not a one-for-one -one substitution. There's something else that's added to it that makes it a little bit better than substitution. That's my personal observation. I think one of the really great things is that Going back to the second bullet, uh, our labs used to be, computer labs used to be booked weeks and weeks in advance, you guys know this, and most of that for research. Well, now the labs at the high school and the middle school are more open, and that's a bigger deal at the middle school because they only have you know two computer labs that are in the media center. Um, so what we're seeing is a lot of that research that used to take place in the classroom, or excuse me, in the computer labs, now taking place in the classroom. A great example of this is a teacher shared with me that she has a student in one of her classes who is consistently fact-checking what she is saying in her lectures. <laughs> and she said initially it was a little bit annoying, and then it really started to be a very positive thing for her because it opened up some other discussions. Yes, you're right, but this context makes it a little different. So that research, we think, has really um, changed how research can happen in the district since kids have it at their fingertips. We've also noticed a lot of uh, people being able to demonstrate adaptability, and a quick story from this is 
Second week of school, we are still just tweaking the Wi-Fi here in the high school. This is a very interesting building with all sorts of elevations. And our network manager, who's just done an excellent job, had to make a fix. Uh, by the time we put the fix out, the kids in many classes had already figured it out and told each other before we could even tell the adults. So uh, this teacher was saying, I'm so impressed how the kids demonstrated their adaptability by being able to solve the problem before the adults could even solve it. We think overall Schoology and our digital textbooks are going well. We hosted some meetings last week uh, where we heard loud and clear that we have a very clear goal of uh, doing some more standardization with how our staff post assignments in Schoology. As with any new kind of thing, we had people who are making a good faith effort to get information out there, but for parents, you know, when one class is doing something on a calendar, another might be doing in a Word document for the week, we'll be working over the next few months to really try to standardize how teachers post at least a minimal level of information in Schoology. And overall, our digital textbooks have gone way better than I ever thought they would. Um, we had some initial difficulties just downloading a couple of them because they're so huge, the, the, the true iBooks that we got. Several of our classes were able to use digital texts that we had bought unknowingly about five or six years ago because they had included the PDF version back then. Uh, but at the same time, we've also had some failure with it, and one of which was a very di significant disappointment with a company who had promised that their app would uh, do just what the other kind of digital text apps do. It was our World History AP class. And unfortunately, we actually had to ask them to send us paper copies because their app was so unreliable for a handful of our students that we just we couldn't um, disrupt the content. But that's part of the learning process. And so again, this is what Dr. Richardson would call the warts and all uh, kind of piece here. Mm -hmm. We've had some technical challenges, which I've outlined in terms of various pieces from Wi-Fi to becoming the internet service provider for essentially a small town the size of bigger than 492 other Minnesota communities. There are 492 Minnesota towns that are less than 2,200 people. That puts a little bit of pressure on us. We've had some human challenges in terms of just the change process and you know that being overwhelming to some folks. And we've had some problems that are related to teenagers. Shocking, right? Uh, in terms of that they might push boundaries and those kinds of pieces. So we have certainly had our challenges as well. Just to let you know about our repairs, so far, remember we're talking about 2,200 plus devices. We've had seven that we've confirmed were lost. We've had nine that were confirmed or that have been reported stolen. When they're stolen, uh, we have the students fill out a form. Actually, if they're lost or stolen, they fill out the form. If they believe it's been stolen, they indicate why. We involve our police liaison officer. The first several times that this happened, miraculously, the device showed up the next day. You know, go figure after the police liaison talked to the students. So um, we are. We're not happy, but we're not terribly concerned. It's, it's a very small percentage, and we told you all along, people would lose them and people would steal them. Uh, we've had, through the 14th, we had 25 cracked screens, and so far we spent $1,897 of that 50,000 plus that we have in reserve for repairs. So as of right now, we're doing, I think, okay. Some, some of those pieces are things that are covered by the warranty in the first year, or some of these things, same things next year we may have to pay for simply because the one-year warranty goes out. We've had the broken screens. We've had a handful more of broken headphone jacks than we thought. That really depends on what kind of headphones kids get. And as you'll hear from our math folks, there's a lot, there's a lot of academic reasons to use headphones. Uh, we've had an interesting phenomenon of some dented volume controls. We, we don't know why that is. Apple has repaired several of them under warranty. We're not sure if it's a unknown flaw with the device or not. One concern that we really do have as we look forward to the collection of the devices in the spring is the fact that um, so many people have all these cords around their house. We're concerned about kids for, and parents just not remembering to return them when they return their device. And the cords aren't cheap. To buy the full cord set, they're $34. So uh, we are really trying to be proactive in how we collect those cords at the end of the year along with a device. So just something that we're concerned about. Reflecting. What we've done is we've uh, had a student focus group here at the high school. We had two parent and community meetings over the last couple weeks, several of you attended those. Thank you very much for doing that. We're working on a number of surveys. Actually, the Mayor's Youth Council did a survey uh, earlier this fall, as did the high school, did a, a survey of students at the high school, how they were feeling about certain components of iPads at that point. And we're also looking at doing our mid-year survey, which would be of parents, students, and staff, and that will be coming over the next couple of weeks here. We've also been hosting some monthly secondary staff discussions in lieu of one of our training sessions. So our current analysis, as you might expect, less than six months into this thing, 
Uh, some things are going better than expected. There are things that are not going as well as we would thought that they would. Uh, many experts will tell you that we're in what's called the messy middle of implementation, so we're beyond the beginning of where we were all very excited that this dream was becoming a reality, the vision was starting to take place. Mm -hmm. Then you get six weeks in and people realize, oh, we're really doing this. And then those warts begin to show. Uh, we've come a long way and we have learned a lot in five months. In fact, we've done a number of discussions with schools, one of which, uh, some of you know Jim Pritchard in our community, he's the uh, president of the Rotary. I had a, a FaceTime conference with his daughter who's getting ready to start a one-to-one -one initiative in her school in Indiana next year. And what we've learned in just six months, it's immeasurable to what we can share with people about how to do it better the next time. And so we are very reflective on that, but we also have a long way to go. This is uh, a work in progress, and while we've seen some very positive things, we've also seen some things that we need to figure out, and uh, we continue to address those pieces. So let's talk about the vision and action. For those of you who are counting, I was nine minutes and 45 seconds, so that was under my goal, which is good. So vision and action, um, Carl Wieselman and Paul Eddy are here tonight to talk with you about the flipped classroom. And uh, instead of, um, I hope you like the pancake flip there, right? A little bit of effort at humor here. Very little. Uh, but Carl and Paul thought that they would give you a taste of what their students have. So I have a video that we're going to play that is similar to what they will use with their students in terms of the flipped classroom. And then they will stand for questions that you have. Um, I'll also accept questions at that time. And then at the end of that, I'll talk with you about the proposed position that Dr. Richardson mentioned that we're just providing you for information tonight. Well, good evening. Thanks for having us uh, into the meeting tonight so we can share a little bit about what we're doing in our classroom. My name is Paul Eddie. You'll hear uh, from Carl Wiesman here in just a minute. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the flipped classroom tonight. Uh, we're going to compare it, first of all, to a traditional class. In a traditional class, during class, we would have question and answer on uh, current and past materials. We'd lecture on the new material. And then outside of class, their homework would be to work on the practice problem. What happens in the flipped classroom is we take this question and answer piece, and we still <coughs> have to start every class to see if they have anything uh, that they need to know or any questions that they've got. The big difference is the learning of curriculum that actually happens outside of the class. And what that is, is a video similar to the one that you're watching right now. And that's kind of why we're presenting this, <coughs> this way this evening. Uh, finally, the working on assignments, which would typically happen outside of class, now happens inside of class. And the biggest advantage we've seen to that is we have time as instructors to work with our students to help them when they have trouble as opposed to the old way when they go home and have questions <coughs> that parents probably no longer can answer because of the, uh, the rigor of the curriculum. Now we are able to help them out during class with any questions that they've got. Good evening, I'm Carl Wieselman and I'm going to be talking to you about what has worked well and what hasn't worked well in our change here. First and foremost, I think we've been building relationships with students by working on them with their homework, being there to answer their questions when they come up. We've truly been able to strengthen our relationships. Um, one of the another one of the bonuses is we are requiring less and getting more from the assignments. What we mean by that is we're no longer no, the goal of the homework is no longer just getting it done. They are doing the homework to understand the concepts. We're not requiring that they do X amount of problems. We're just saying you do these problems until you've got it and then move on. Um, we feel also that more students are learning the concepts. We've added a mastery component, which means they have to get 75% uh, or better on all assessments uh, before they're able to move on to the next, the next uh, part of the curriculum. <coughs> they're developing better work habits. Um, some of the students are really, this has really turned around their, uh, their feelings of success. Um, one of the biggest bonuses, which we didn't even think about when we started this, was makeup work when they're gone. They no longer, if they miss a day in class, they're no longer missing a lecture. They can still watch it at home and catch themselves up very quickly. Also, any makeup work that we do in class, 
they can, or any makeup tests or anything like that, they can do them in class. There's no longer that struggle to try to find a time that will work. Um, some of the things that haven't worked well, I've had a few students get caught in the retake cycle where they're always behind because they're always working on the previous section, trying to get caught up. Um, but I've also had some people now, some students who've been able to escape that retake cycle. So I think, I think that's, that's leveling itself out. Um, some students don't always have time or don't, or choose not to study the videos. Again, that's that freedom to fail con uh, component. It ties in with uh, what we're doing with the assignments and not requiring they do X amount of problems. We're giving them more ownership and more responsibility in their education. Um, some students do prefer the interaction of in-person lessons and quite honestly, there is that need to ask a question right at that point when you're trying to learn something that, that we haven't found a cure for yet. Um, we Some of the things we've been working on we haven't done well is consistent formative assessment. We need to do a better job of that in the class and we need to do a better job of finding uh, enrichment opportunities for some of the upper level students in our class. And up to this point it's just been a function of time. Some of the things that have uh, made this transition go well for us certainly include job sharing. Carl and I have uh, really split up the responsibilities. I've worked mostly on the assessment. Carl's worked on setting up the, uh, the templates for the videos. And we really couldn't do this uh, to the effectiveness that we have without uh, having each other to rely on. Also the iPads, uh, the students have always have the technology they need to watch the videos even if they don't watch it at home. You know, they've got class time, they can watch with their headphones even during class or review them during class if needed. Schoology is used to send the videos to the students and that's been uh, <coughs> immensely helpful. We have to be able to get the information to them. All the results that we have seen so far, they've really been energizing both for us as teachers and just to see the students and, and how much, how well they use that work time in class. Carl and I have constantly been reflecting and trying to figure out ways to make this even better and we're constantly finding those things and just little pieces here and there that can, can make the whole thing work even better for us. And the students have been awesome as we keep modifying things and they, they've been great in, in uh, trying out some new things. All right, so we recently did a survey of the students and one of the questions we asked them was, you know, do you feel, how do you feel your learning is going? And at least 76% of them felt they were learning at least as much or more using the flipped classroom. I think from our observations, we would say it is higher than that. Um, also, another one of the questions we asked in the survey was, how do you feel about continuing to use that? And again, 75% of them were at least neutral to uh, continuing our use of the flipped classroom. Now, I wish we had better data to compare geometry nine students previously to what we're doing now, but we've changed all the assessments and I think that's been a positive thing. But I also flipped my Algebra 3 classes and you can take a look at here the results over the past three years in red is the current year and they were below or at the same level before I flipped the classroom and since flipping the classroom they have consistently scored higher on all my assessments. With that, we want to open the floor to any questions that you might have. Check out the office. I'm Paul. I'm Carl. <laughs> Board members, questions, comments? Julie? Uh, thank you for that presentation. That was that was really fun to see. And, and the results are really um, amazing. And um, I thought it was great that Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was great that there were math teachers here tonight because one of the things that we heard in the um, parent community meetings and what parents have got me asking is they felt like math in general was a little bit more cumbersome on the iPad than some of the other courses. And I'm wondering specifically how the kids are doing the homework on the iPad or if they're if there's another way that they're doing, are they specifically doing it on the iPad, or are they doing it on paper and handing it in? If you could just kind of talk through how that's working. Uh, it varies. Okay. And it varies for me from class to class, from student to student. Because the textbooks are on the iPads, a lot of students tend to use that as their book, 
and they continue to do their assignments on paper. They're more comfortable that way. Uh, if we send a worksheet, however, through as a PDF through Schoology, they can open that in Notability. And if we provide enough workspace, a lot of them will do the homework um, on the iPad in Notability. Some students, even with that option, will continue to do it on paper. They're just more comfortable that way at this point. Yeah, I could add to that. I, I think some of the students really prefer to use the iPad, and so they will open a, a blank page in Notability and do their assignment on that. Um, it does get cumbersome flipping back and forth between the textbook and that. Um, so that's, that's perfectly a, a valid observation there. But you're seeing kids take a personal decision in terms yeah. of which way they think, think about one of our goals was personalization and something I learned right away. Personalization doesn't mean they do everything on the device. Personalization, I mean, if I think that doing it on paper for me is better, the goal is personalization. The device was a vehicle help us get there. It really has in a number of ways, but I really think if you come into this lab in the morning, you'll see kids with their iPad out with a piece, you know, up on the iPad and at a computer. We're seeing kids really adapt to what is best for them. And that's, that's just fine by me, and I think it's fine by most people. I think another thing to add in that regard, that some students have requested a second iPad because when they were, the beginning of the year, they took all their notes on their iPad and notability. Mm -hmm. Uh, we still want them to take notes even though they're watching it on a video. So they've got the video that they want to watch and at the same time they want to take notes on their iPad. Mm -hmm. And so some students have told me they, they watch the videos on their home computer while taking notes on their iPad and, and it's just a variety of ways students are making do and, and figuring out as, as we're figuring it out, they're figuring it out. One, one more thing I wanted to add with that is we're actually not collecting assignments. One of the things with this geometry is, you know, we're there working on it with them. We see what they're doing, um, and we're not requiring them to do this entire assignment. They're kind of doing what they feel they need to do. The only time we really collect them is if they don't pass the first assessment, then we collect their assignments before they can retake it to make sure they've actually done it. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting because in most cases the parents said that the, the student really wanted to do math on the iPad and was frustrated with having to go back, but, and I don't know, maybe in, in some way felt like it was a failure or something, and then the parents kind of worked with them, and no, you've really, to Matt's point, have to figure out what works for you. Now, when you talk about the, the headphones, do you find that most students are finding access to them? Do you have extras in the classroom, or are they getting them on their own? I've got about five extra pair in my classroom. Um, most students have them. Okay. And I, at, I think at one time I've had two of them being used, two of my sets being used at the same time. Otherwise, they always have them. Okay, good. Thank you. Other questions or comments? John? Uh, Matt, uh, could you uh, explain the, the, the Schoology issue and the access to materials? Uh, that I guess that's one of the complaints that I've heard from some uh, parents is that students are having a hard time finding their materials and, and understanding what their assignments are and, and that things aren't uniformly being uh, posted to school I guess is what that is. Could you repeat? I think uh, you captured it quite well, John, and uh, I'll just go, sorry. I think that, as Jeff Peshta puts it, at the beginning of the year for us to dictate to staff, hey, this is exactly how everyone is going to put these assignments into Schoology, we didn't have a great idea of what was the best practice. And so we intentionally shared with people that here are multiple ways to do it, and people found what was the best way for them. Now that's good for a teacher learning how to use the system, but the byproduct of that has been there is a lack of consistency, and I think we would all admit it, you know, in terms of the fact that in, in some classes you may see someone who uses the calendar, you know, very effectively. In some other cases, they may post a PDF document that here's the content for the week. On Monday, we're going to do this on Tuesday. So, again, they're getting the content out, but um, it, one of the things that we know we have to improve is, is standardizing on here is the base level of how everyone's going to put those items in. And then if you need to customize it or add to it from there, you certainly can. Uh, but that is an area that we know is, has been an issue for some students. Uh, one thing that we do know, again, is at the beginning of the year, Schoology was new to everyone. You know, so there was that piece of just ramping up to begin with. But as we reflect on and heard from uh, several folks in the community and 
It's something that we've heard from our own staff, uh, even our own staff who are helping students in structured study halls and those kinds of pieces. We have just said we need to find and uh, define one way in which at least the assignments will be put in and then from there people will need to have some flexibility. No two subject areas are the same. Even within a subject area, no two classes are the same and how you may distribute some of those materials uh, will be a little bit different from class to class. That's that adaptability piece that we've talked about, but at the same time, we absolutely understand that there's, we have to find what's the best way for people to be consistent. And that's a goal of ours over the next few months. So we don't have a resolution? Not yet in terms of we're looking at what seems to be the most effective for people. And as uh, Jeff really puts it well, that we now have seen what are probably the most effective methods of doing it. And those are the pieces that we're gonna push people um, to utilize that as the, as the main strategy. Again, when we're trying to let people um, use the tool in the way that best fits their content in their classroom, there's going to be some difference. There's you know, no two ways around it. Before, uh, we didn't have it all in the same way. Some people might have put something on the blackboard, some people might have handed out a sheet of paper. You know, before, people weren't completely the same across the board. I think it's just even more viewable now for a lot of folks. Uh, and one other question for you. One of the, the other concerns that I've heard from parents occasionally is that if their home internet is down and the students say that they don't have access to the materials, is it the practice that most of the materials and assignments are downloaded to the <coughs> iPad or that they're <coughs> downloaded just in time as they're supposed to be reading them or what is the what is the instruction and what, what is the, the function? You know I think that it is dependent upon the student. Um, I have two children at home, both using this, and one will always have them downloaded before she leaves school. I gave it away who that was. Uh, the other might be at 10, 15 at night trying to figure out. Now, fortunately, uh, we've been relatively successful with our home internet being uh, somewhat reliable, and I do think most people are. Uh, the, um, the disconnection from the internet seems to be the new, the dog ate my homework, or I forgot it in um, my locker kind of piece from time to time. We did have a couple of issues ourselves at the beginning of this school year where uh, because we are now essentially an internet service provider for 2,300 people where we had a couple of equipment issues as we were figuring things out and one of them was our, our upstream provider um, and that is a real problem. And so we have done, as you know, we have done an immeasurable amount of preparation on the infrastructure side and I think we, knock on Vernier, um, have a, a good piece now. but. You're right, John, if, if kids do put it into notability in school, they're going to have it at home. If they're waiting to download it from Schoology until they get home, if their internet is disrupted, they may have a challenge getting that. So I think that's another piece of what kids are learning. And I think our staff are adapting to that as well. When we had, our, when we had issues ourselves, when it was our fault, we sent something out to staff to let them know about it, to say the students are not telling you a fib, this was our fault, and you know here's the situation. So does that... Yeah, it's not a perfect, I'm just, it's the real answer. And I don't know if you guys want to say anything about if you've had issues with kids saying they couldn't. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's one of those things, one of the, a couple of things I did when we went to this was, number one, I put an extension cord with a multi-plug into my bag, so I've always got it, so kids whose iPads weren't charged, I could help them out and they wouldn't have to go sit somewhere in a corner or anything. Um, same way, I, from day one, I just said, you know, you, you've got to do screenshots of the textbook before you go home you, and um, download, since we went to this flipped classroom, you can download the videos in school and then you've got it when you're at home and you're responsible for doing that. And your text is a PDF, so the fact, no, not, not this the one, one correct, yes. This one is, I, my Algebra 3 class is not, so that one they have to pull it up and take screenshots of. And that's an example of how textbook companies and specifically textbook salespeople don't always tell us the exact truth because we did a tremendous amount of research on the math textbook and everything that we were told was doesn't matter it's downloaded to the device no problem then when we installed it we realized no that's not the case in this scenario and uh, Carl had a few interesting chats uh, that I had a chance to sit by with some of the people from the company shall remain nameless uh, at the beginning of the year. But most of the textbooks are downloaded to the device. There are just a handful of them that require that internet connectivity. And uh, we're letting other people know that too. When people call us and say what was good, what was not, we're telling them, hey, 
these companies have been excellent to work with on the textbook side. These folks have some way to go. And our voice carries a lot with other people. Just one more question. If, if, the, if the textbook... Turn your mic on. Yeah. What? Turn your mic on. If, if the, there we go. <laughs> I like it better the other way. Um, the, if the textbook is a PDF, it, what sort of reader app are are you using? Is it one that allows the students to make notes on the text while they're while they're looking at it and all the things we weren't allowed to do in school? They can do it either way. <laughs> they can they can just look look at the PDF or they can open it up in Notability and then they can make notes on it if they want. At our high school, you know what Carl was referring to is they can either download it in the iBooks app and some of the older PDFs they'll have less interactability with or they can put it into Notability, but with our high school students where they have access to the App Store, I will tell you I've seen dozens of kids with different kinds of things that they're using that meet their particular needs. So, so the Notability allows highlighting and note-taking and all kinds of right annotations right on the, thank you. And some of the newer ones, John, some of the newest ones, like for example our American History Book, not only can students highlight in the actual text, it's a truly built interactive textbook, then they can go back and tab on a little piece that says notes, and it will show them all the pages and the notes that they took, and can even establish flashcards for them. So that's some of the newer interactive texts that we're, we only have a couple of those. You know, most of our stuff is the older, you know, PDF stuff that we've converted up, but some of the new stuff, our Pearson e-text for our biology <coughs> class is similar, you know, in terms of highlighting, and it's, it is pretty incredible. Thank you. Julie? You're kind of the uh, first teachers that we've had a chance to talk to about the iPad. <laughs> so we're kind of all anxious with questions. And, um, you know, the parent commu community meetings were so informative and so there was parents that were so honest about what was working and what wasn't. And one of the things they talked about was the distractions, you know, in general. And I imagine in the flipped classroom, they're so having to be engaged and getting their homework done or that they're maybe not, you know, trailing off in other directions. But Carl, in your Algebra 3 class, where you're not doing the flipped classroom, how are you finding their level of engagement? Are they, is the iPad becoming a distraction from your point of view? Actually, in the Algebra 3, I, I did flip the class. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And, but I do have one class that isn't flipped, and I okay. know you have several. Um, and yeah, it's more of a distraction in the classes that aren't flipped. There's no doubt about it. it it's, I honestly can tell just by standing in the back of the classroom, not, I don't even have to be looking. I can tell when students are basically done with their assignment because that's when the distractions start to happen, you know. But they're just, they're amazing. They amaze me every day with their work ethic and they're ninth graders and that really surprises me. So. There's definitely a, um, they have access to the distraction with the iPads. I mean, and I think as teachers, we're learning how to best deal with that. Um, certainly there are times when the students are playing games when they should be doing something else. Uh, and when you, my experience has been when I go over and just remind them what they're supposed to be doing, I've never had a problem with them saying no later, you know, I'm gonna play now. That's not been a problem. Uh, getting them to make the right choices every time is, well, that's, they're teenagers. And, and so we have to continue to remind them from time to time that, that they need to make the right choice. You know, we had a, uh, on our January 19th day a week ago, or was whatever it was last Friday, the 20th, forgive me, I don't even know what day it is anymore, the crazy weather this month, but uh, we actually, I facilitated two discussions in the afternoon, hour and 15 minute each, for anybody who was interested in coming, talking about engagement and distraction in education. And what we did is we went back to talking about how do we engage students. We talked about what, what is the definition of student engagement? How do you define student engagement? Just like many people, they say, well, I'm not sure I can put a complete definition to it, but I know it when I see it. And it's that piece of students being act, are actively working on the task that has been assigned by the teacher. Then we talked about what are the conditions that, you know, how do we design our lessons to um, really emphasize engagement, how to make it engaging for the entire period, with or without technology. What is good teaching is good teaching. And that's what we're trying to help folks come back to that, you know, that yes, there is there's no question that you have a device that can take you anywhere in the world. 
And there's a lot of good with that. And there's also some things that aren't so good about that. I think one of my personal pieces is that I hope, I know, I believe that moving forward, students are going to have more distraction in their life than not. You've seen Google Glass. You've seen the contact lenses that are now starting to come out where they're going to, or not come, but they're in the stage of where they're developing them, where you're going to be able to see some things within your contact lens. We saw last week a contact lens that can actually uh, track your glucose level for diabetics. You're going to see more and more of that. So our hope, my hope, would be that we continue to help prepare students for their future, which is going to be uh, a situation where they're going to have access to a plethora of different distractions. How do they, I'd rather them learn that here than learn that when they're paying at a college or pay for it by losing their job somewhere. So these are real issues, they are problems, and we wouldn't uh, be facing them if we didn't have this incredible learning tool for them as well. So there's issues with it, but we continue to work on it. It does come back to how do we design things so that they're engaging. Other questions? I had, oh, Carrie, go ahead. Well, I, I don't even know how to ask this because I, I don't have kids in your classes, you know. Um, so I'm trying to get a picture of, of what the workload is like for the, the teachers now. Um, the students have the textbook on the iPad, and then are you preparing these, these lectures for them to watch at home? And then in the classroom, you're working with them on their homework. Do I have the picture? I've painted the you, picture you, right. You got it. Okay. So is that way more work? Is it more efficient work? Is it, I, I'm just trying to get a, a feel for what it's done to your lives. We've been busy. <laughs> uh, straightforward. We've been busy. Uh, we've been putting in a lot of time, especially the first time through. We think we can reuse a lot of these videos next year. Okay. Um, no, but yeah. and we're discussing what went well, what didn't as we go, and we're going to do it this way differently next year. But for the most part, I think we'll be able to use a lot of it, uh, reuse again, but this first year, especially with the mastery component where we're writing multiple versions of every test so they can retake uh, different assessments. Um, it's been a lot of work, it's been busy. I'm more tired after a flipped classroom hour than I am after lecturing for an hour just because okay. I am flying around the classroom helping individual students and, yep. and it's awesome and it's fun and it's exhausting and, uh, but, but it's been invigorating because yeah. the kids are excited about it too. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Anyone else? Julie? I just wanted to make one quick comment about Schoology. Um, thir Wednesday night when they had to call the two hour late for Thursday, parents had just gotten the phone call or the email and Joel Lear already had a message in Schoology about how it would affect finals the next day. It was amazing. I had just said to my daughter, Two hours late tomorrow, and she said, "Yeah, I know. We just got to, you know, from from Mr. Lear, you know, how we're going to handle tomorrow." So I thought that was extremely effective because those kids, you know, they're all freaked out about finals, and to know exactly how it's going to play out the next day that quickly was was really amazing. Well, and you know, the the thing that's been highlighted about school would be the most is people's frustration with the lack of consistency in the posting assignments, and that's what's in people's wheelhouse every day. But the other side of it is that there have been so many positive comments that we've had about Schoology, uh, ranging from the middle school math teacher who shared with me, you know, before if I had a handful of students who got ahead of the game, I'd have to get somebody to run down to the copier to give the next lesson. Now I have it all queued up and I'm ready to go and those kids, if they've got 15 minutes left, there, there's no downtime, they're getting the next thing. And he said, that's such a huge piece for me. Uh, to the chemistry teacher who posted on one of the days that we did not have school, said, hey, happy cold day. I've got some reading for you to do. Here it is. And, uh, and you'll need it tomorrow. One of our goals with it was to extend the classroom walls. And we have not, we have done that in what I would call pockets of wow to this point. But that's what your first year is, you know what I mean, in terms of those kinds of pieces. So there are people who have blown the doors off this and are really using it in a hybrid fashion. You know, like what Carl and Paul have shared with you, and there are others who are still working through how does it work in their area, and, and that's exactly where we thought we would be this year. We knew there'd be some people who'd be way ahead. We knew there'd be some people right where we expected them to be, um, and others who need some additional help. And so we have people all over the map, but there are some really positive pieces of how 
Schoology has been used to interact. And one of the interesting things, if you look on your child's Schoology, they have the ability to like, just like they do on Facebook. <laughs> and you'll see the principals put up a note, and there are 300 and some likes, you know. Then you know at least 300 kids read it, right? And how many of us would know that they did that before? So I think there's been successes. There's been things that haven't been so successful. And we roll up our sleeves every day to do what's right for kids. Other comments or questions? So I had one comment. Um, the parent session that I was at, I was in a small group with a, a couple who have a student in your classroom. So I would like to congratulate you because it was transformative for their student. They, part of the reason I think they came that night was to talk about how wonderful it was, particularly in the math subject. So um, just congratulations. That was what it, that was what we hoped. And so it was really nice to hear that story. And then I have one question for you, Matt, is one of the things that came up was just parents feeling like their inability to help their child. And it wasn't clear if it was some of the consistency of Schoology or, or just not knowing the device. Will there be sessions coming up for parents, like at conferences? I know we've got a lot of parents coming in the buildings. We actually did host during fall parent-teacher conferences at the middle school. Mr. Pesher and I at the middle school held uh, open Schoology question and answer mm -hmm. sessions. So people, there was no formal program, but people would come in, we would help them with various things. Frankly, it was not all that well attended. Mm -hmm. At the high school, I was unable to be there at that time due to another commitment, but I, I thought they were looking at doing a school with session during the fall parent-teacher conferences. However, Aaron Mayberry and I are working together on putting together through community education um, parent sessions for Schoology mm -hmm. and notability at this point is what we're looking at. Okay. Very good. And we have learned so much. We had plans and we did a lot of that at the beginning of last year, but if we were to rewind, we would even do that differently this year. Great. Just, I guess just one other question, and Paul and Carl, thank you very much. We really appreciate you stepping out as many of our other staff have done and saying, let's see how we can make this work. <coughs> you know, I, I guess having been a math teacher in, in a former life a million years ago, you know, the kind of that frame of you brought kids in, you, the first 15 minutes was Let's check the answers to your homework. Then there was 15 minutes of present the new lesson. And then if they were lucky, they got a little bit of chance to start working on their homework at the end. When you look at the flipped classroom now, what do you see as, is there one thing that kind of stands out for you in terms of the impact it has on kids when they actually get to your classroom and you're working with them? <laughs> you thought I was going to talk a lot and then you'd have a short answer, but it went the other way. So. That was the hope. Um, we, we, some of our feedback we've gotten is it's somewhat, it's, you know, there's a negative with everything. Some of them say, you know, it's, there's so much time between when we get this information and then start to use it, that's a negative. But what I've found too, we found, if we can start the class with refocusing them on what uh, on what the curriculum is and you know maybe work through one sometimes it's as little as just open to this page read through these directions okay now go to it they're right back into it and, and they're just they're able to hit the ground running i think the, the greatest thing that i've seen out of it is um, I've got so much time to work with my individual students mm -hmm. and help them with what they need. It's so student-centered. They bring to class every day what it is that they need help with. And then we're there to be a resource. And that, that's been the, the greatest part for me is, is when I'm bouncing around the room for the whole hour helping different students, I'm not helping every kid with the same thing. I'm helping one student who still needs to retake that last quiz, and I'm helping somebody else with today's stuff, and I'm helping somebody else with yesterday's stuff, but instead of coming down on them because you're, you haven't learned it when we wanted you to learn it, we're just, we want you to learn it. And maybe not on the same time schedule as we want, but at least you're still working towards learning it. Instead of you didn't understand that last concept or that last quiz, you did horrible, you didn't understand it, but oh, well, we're moving on. That doesn't help because, especially in math, everything builds on the other stuff, and when they miss that stuff, they never get it back. And we have time now because we're not teaching the law. We have time to fill in those gaps and help individual students. So I'm really hearing you say that the, the piece is that it, it really allows you to help kids work toward mastery. 
exactly. and you can do that because you have the time to work with kids and you see they've already looked at it they've already tried it out and when they come to you now they're really asking meaningful questions about what they don't know we're really able to meet them exactly where they're at um, uh, when we were preparing for this I had a conversation with one of our high school counselors and this brought to mind something I wanted to include in the video and forgot but they, they had the comment in years past they were bombarded but with requests for tutors for ninth graders in this geometry class and sh she said there's just it's a non-issue now they don't get any requests for tutors because we're there to be their tutor you know when they need it so may i ask the two questions that came up I just, is that okay can i ask i want to ask you two, you two questions that i thought of as we were standing here one of which is how do you believe the relationships that you have with your students are different now than in the past that you're working on with them one-on-one -on -one? And the second piece is, are you at the point now where you are able to, because you work so closely with these students, are you able to start to anticipate, I think, student Y is, might struggle with this because they struggle with something else. Before you were looking at the data, now you're not only looking at the data, but you're working with kids. Are you starting to see that kind of piece developed where you're anticipating a kid's need? I'll take the second question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how is that different than before? <laughs> I, I, because you work with them one-on-one, -on -one, truthfully, I, I know I, I have a lot better working relationship with the students who struggle because those are the ones I'm working with more than the ones who just get it and they're going to get it whether I teach standing on my head or no matter how I deliver it, they're going to get it. There's some students that just get it. It's easy for them. Those students I probably haven't gotten to know any better than I would have before. But the students who who struggle with it and who for whom math doesn't come easily, they work hard, but math just doesn't come easily for them. I've gotten to know those students really well. And yeah, I do get to know what it is where they're going to have troubles and uh, you can anticipate that a little bit more. I just always think of something that I've always lived my educational life by, which is kids don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think that's what you heard. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, kids who are struggling really know these guys care about them because they're giving them the best thing they can, which is individual attention. And so congratulations, because these are some of our trailblazers. And you know, the other night, there's, there's several people in the math department who are working through this. The other night, last week, I'm in my uh, kitchen making lunches for the next day, and all of a sudden, I hear your friend and mine, Ray Coudre, in my living room. And I did this double take, and here my son was watching a video that Ray had actually made back in October. He was preparing for his final, and he was going back and watching one of these videos that was made in October as a review. I can't think of a better review you know, in terms of that, because I can actually go back to the authentic instruction, which is huge. If you also think, remember a year or so ago, the social studies PLC came here from the high school and talked about some stuff that's very similar to this. They talked about mastery, right? The concepts are very similar, so I think you should, that's a heartening thing to me that we're seeing this in a number of different areas. So, any other questions for our superstars here? Okay, thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you so thank much. You. Good job. And then just to, to point your attention in the pack at the table file to a piece that we just wanted to share with you for information tonight. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but as you know, a year ago, right about now, a year ago, we went to um, propose the Director of Administrative Services scenario where we essentially did a lot of combination of the HR technology and Director of Business Affairs roles and then really essentially had a full-time manager in each of those what we call back office areas. And the one area at that time that we made a conscientious decision not to fill something with was technology. Part of the reason was um, I've been doing it for almost 20 years. Uh, and the fact was that we were at the beginning of the transformational technology project and we just didn't think that it was a good time to transition. And so just for your consideration moving forward, what I've included in the packet is just some background and rationale for why we'd be looking at that uh, and some of the descriptors of the individual we'd be looking for. We've also included what is a draft job description that's been reviewed by a number of people. And uh, there's a lot of people who'd like this for a lot of different <laughs> kinds of things, um, but we've landed on that this is the original draft and it's just for your consideration. We're not asking you to do anything with it tonight. I know it wasn't in the regular packet, so I, I certainly know you're just looking at it, but I wanted to highlight that we just, uh, as Dr. Richards and I have reviewed the strategy, it's something that we'd always intended to try to fill something in that technology area. Um, focusing more heavily on the instructional side, but also doing some of the other kinds of things as well. 
So if you have a chance to review that, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and we'll bring it back for a, an opportunity for discussion at the next board meeting. Are there any initial questions on that at all? Looks like everyone's kind of absorbing. Yep, it. please do. Yep, that's why we brought it there. So was the idea tonight is just to give you a chance to have it, look at it. We'll bring it back for discussion before we would come back then for an additional opportunity to consider. Gary? Man, I just wanted to clarify, this would be a non-cabinet level. Correct. It would be in our uh, director. Yeah. Um, it's, it would be a, just a, a non-cabinet position. It would be essentially on our district services leadership team, which we've developed around HR, finance, child nutrition, and buildings and grounds. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that there. Thanks, Matt. All right, we are ready to move on to our second item, which is the financial forecast in 2014-2015 general fund budget plan. And Val will be presenting, and you should have had in your packet um, a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. And the narrative, right. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to go over the financial forecast um, and then our what our budget plan is looking like for 2014-15 uh, already if we can believe that. Okay. Um, so just what I'm going to cover um, basically with any financial forecast, you're going to start with what we know and what's projected. So enrollment projections, what our financial assumptions will be and the summary of our 14-15 budget parameters and then what the timeline looks like for me to bring those budgets um, to you for approval. Okay, so what we know um, for fiscal year 13, the general, fund, the general fund basically broke even. Uh, we had $60,000 more revenue than expenditures, um, which is a great situation to be in because we're spending our resources on the great programming. Um, you know, we're not here to be a bank. Um, so that's that's great. That's how we ended fiscal year 13. Um, we know that our enrollment drives about 70% of our total revenue. Um, so we obviously keep a close eye on that. 78% of our total expenditures are just for salaries and benefits. Uh, we are a people business and that's a great thing for kids. And our 13-14 budget, uh, which you guys just approved a couple meetings ago, <coughs> has revenues of 41.6 million and expenditures of 41.7, basically a break even again. We're looking at a deficit production of 0.2% or about 100,000 or so. So for enrollment, our average daily membership is calculated over the entire school year, and they apply a weighting to each grade grouping. And as you might remember, the legislative session actually changed what the weightings will be for 14-15 um, based with the all-day kindergarten. So you can see what the 13-14 weights are currently for this year, um, and then what they went. Kindergarten obviously coming up to 1.0, um, and then 7 through 12 being at the 1.2. So lots of changes going on there um, to complicate things if they weren't already complicated enough. Although presented as being a simplification of the budget before. Always, yes. So this is what the weighted average daily membership looks like. We take our ADMs times those weightings. So for 13-14, um, that top row is what we are looking at this year. So we're looking at a total of um, 4,424.7, um, which is what they take the basic formula revenue times. So for comparative purposes, what I did was took our 13-14 bottom or ADMs times the new weightings, so you could see. So, you know, going down to the new weightings, it looks like we have, you know, a 250 drop, kid drop, um, which is not the case. It's just the change in weightings. Um, but that way, comparatively, you could see going forward what it's going to look like. Um, small increase for next year is projected, um, and then a slight decrease for the remaining years after that. Basically, very stable enrollment, um, which is what we've had for the last several years. So. 
Nothing too alarming. Uh, we are looking forward to doing the demographic study and having some better data and making sure that this is in line with what um, what comes through on that. So. So for our financial assumptions, um, we obviously have set the 16% unassigned fund balance as a percentage of our total general fund expenditures. So we always keep that um, in front. And then I assumed that we would hold our assigned fund balance flat. Our assigned fund balance currently is basically our OPEB liability and a reserve for our self-insurance fund, um, just kind of keeping a reserve for those liabilities that we have outstanding. Our revenue assumptions, I'm projecting a 1% increase in the basic formula revenue um, beginning in 1516, um, which would be the, the new first year of the new biennium. Um, we obviously already know what is gonna happen next year because um, it's the second year of the biennium. This is pretty conservative um, and you know we know the state's been underfunding us and not keeping up with inflation which has been running on more than eight percent um, or if they are providing us with new revenue it's tied to a specific program like all the kindergarten so um, definitely you know could change based on the political landscape but I like to keep it conservative um, so we're going with the one percent we know our referendum has an inflationary increase. We are also planning for um, continued sequestration of our federal funding. They're still projecting 5% each year. Um, they won't give you a, <laughs> a set number of years, but we'll plan for that for a little while still. And then all of our other local revenue um, or non-formula revenue was just held flat. Um, so we're looking at an aggregate increase of total 3.4% revenue. Our expenditure assumptions, uh, we're looking at salary and benefit increases on average for all the employee groups of 5.3%. We are going to see um, a 0.5% increase in TRA again um, next year. They've done 0.5 I think for the last three years going to catch up. And then our non-salary average increase of about 2%, um, that includes things like utilities and supplies and insurance and that sort of thing. That is consistent with what we've done for the last several years. Um, so we're looking at an aggregate increase of about 4.7% for the expenditures. So when you put that all together, um, it's a little hard to read. It's a lot of data in one spot. Um, I had the little laser that would have been good <laughs> um, but basically if you look in the 2012-13 we ended um, down the SOD reserve percentage down towards the bottom with um, basically almost 20 a 23% on the sign fund balance and then our 13-14 year which we're in now um, is showing slightly worse than what we're projecting um, but still ending basically you know, 22%, so still ending where, we're, where we thought. Um, so 14, 15, we are looking at 42.9 million in revenues and 43.7 in expenditures. Um, so we are looking at spending down, you know, roughly um, 800,000 of our unassigned fund balance. And even with that um, spend down, still ending with 19.5% unassigned fund balance. And then going, if you go out further, um, as you know, I will warn you with any financial projection model, it's always gonna look worse than it's probably gonna be. Um, and I think they did that on purpose. But, um, you know, really we're getting under that 16% goal in 15-16. So um, this is consistent with what was presented last January, um, consistent with what we discussed during the referendum process that 15, 16 school years where we would potentially look at um, any type of budget investment. So still financially strong, um, but just would rather be, um, use this as a tool to inform you and make decisions proactively and not react to a budget situation. So, um, but 
consistent with everything that we've been telling you. So, um, and then just the calendar. Um, so each year is kind of it's pretty similar. Um, adapting the resolution, um, allowing the administration to make recommendations for changes. Um, I have March 10th on here. I do think this will probably be coming to you in February. Um, and then adapting any resolutions relating to the program staffing changes. Um, and then, you know, each of the budgets in turn with the general fund budget being that last meeting in May. Um, and then you would be adapting all of the budgets um, June 9th. So with that, um, do you guys have any questions about any of that information? No. Are the waitings for the ADM locked in for 2013-14? Yes. How far out are they locked in? W well, what do you mean by the wait? Like the calculations that they multiply it by? Yeah. The 1.0. The 1.0, yeah. Yep, that's been... Um, that's what they've used for several years now, those particular calculations. So I'm nervous. Yeah, I think no, uh, I think the answer would be that they are locked in until the legislature would make another change. You know, that was the change that they made last year was to try to simplify it, but until they would choose to make another change, they're locked in. And I, Chris, you've got the, the memory, how long it had been since they had changed the weightings. I think those the waitings we had previously, except for some small tweaks, have been there the entire time I've been in Minnesota. So uh, this was a, a major change. And while the concept of simplification was laid out, the other issue that I think we are all looking at is the fact that because we lost the extra waiting on, on basically students in um, first grade through 12th grade from the current wait waitings that we had in the previous year, then they had to do some mathematical manipulation to try to keep the levy, this levy impact the same, to keep the amount of dollars the same. Um, I think many of us at that time said we're kind of waiting and seeing to see if this will all play out in the end. Uh, but I think the other thing that's pretty Clear is even though there was new money put into kindergarten, all of the money didn't come from just new money from the state. Some of it came from the fact that they extracted weighted costs out of other grade levels. So uh, this one is one that, that's probably one of the, the biggest pieces that we are kind of waiting to see have all the shoes dropped. Yeah. The other big thing, and, and as Val shared, is she shared with you the projection model going forward is that once we get beyond the 14-15 year where it is just pure conjecture we what we believe we're going to continue to see a one percent increase the logic would be there that if if the the just the inflationary cost just what it costs to do the same business that you did before is going up by 1.8 percent that we could at least hope to get most of what the inflation rate was so that we wouldn't actually have to reduce programs and services uh, because there wasn't enough money just to keep up with where we were but we don't know that and i appreciate what val and matt have done with this in terms of maintaining that very very conservative perspective because again a change over in the governor's office a change over in in either the houses could have significant impact on where people thought they were in terms of what's needed in terms of general fund increases going forward. And it's the reason that we've, I guess, uh, continued to, to press with the board the importance of having a good fund balance. Because you really have the amount of dollars that even going into the end of the 2014-15 year, you've got plenty of dollars to decide how much adjustments you need to make for 15, 16, without having to be in the crisis mode, where there will be a number of districts that will be again in the crisis mode as they move into that next year, because uh, if they don't see the kind of dollars that we've been seeing in the last few, 
um, it's going to be very di difficult to maintain the programs that we're currently operating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was the 50 cent answer to the 5 cent question. Well, yeah. my editorial comment, if I may, is that the legislature can tweak that and it's so deep in the bowels of the legislature it hardly makes a ripple to anybody except the superintendent's office. Well, and, and the taxpaying public yeah, almost doesn't yeah. ever see it. And, and understand that that you know the, this was a major overhaul of the of the K twelve finance system this last year. This time it was, but and and uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, the other is death by a thousand pinpricks because you know small adjustments whether it, it when money there's not enough money in the system simply to keep up with where you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, and off and on through the years, we've had the argument, well, K-12 districts have way too much money, so it's okay not to give them inflationary increase or actually to try to reduce the amount of funding that's being provided. Um, you know, frankly, you know, my sense is that, that as we work with the legislature, we continue to press with them the fact that we should at least be at the rate of inflation. And given, as we've talked many times before, you think about the last 20 years, we're over $2,100 behind where we need to be. So in other words, if we go back 20 years and we look at how much money we had for people to spend and you multiply that by the rate of inflation over that 20 year period, you'd have to add 20, you'd have to add, add $2,100 to the per pupil cost for every pupil just to stay even with where we were before. So we have constantly had to make up the difference and i think obviously you've seen in our district as with others that's resulted in larger class sizes it's resulted in having to get very very creative in terms of how we work with various types of programs but you know there will there comes a point in time for every district that will say to you if there isn't more money coming from the state and the state is giving us 70 percent of the the funding then we have to make reductions in order to mm -hmm maintain the balance. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Other questions? Sorry, right now? Julie? Um, I had a, just wanted to um, touch on the um, decrease in the federal money for the sequestration, yep. um, the 5%. So that's our, our um, things like special ed and title dollars, et cetera. Yep. Um, do we know what the dollar value of that 5% decrease is about? Um, I would say between 100, 100 and 150,000. Okay. So I think we have just under, um, about just under $2 million in federal funding. So it kind of depends, you know, this year we saw a 13% reduction in our Title I funding. So, you know, it's kind of, it depends on the program, but okay. that's what they've, told us is okay. their projection. So. Okay. Thank you. And that is another piece too where um, over the years we have consistently tried to save back some money with the idea that we, we were trying to level the or at least smooth the, the slide in terms of the amount of dollars that were available. So uh, over the years Gary and Mary and others have, have tried to say if there are any dollars left in, in title that we can amend the budget and shift over into the next year to help keep the drop from being as great. But when you have an ongoing 5% reduction, uh, that's going to, the ability to do that is also going to go away mm -hmm. and probably more quickly because now we're not talking about keeping up with inflation, we're talking about having a 5% deflation in the funding every single year. Other questions? I have one. On the um, new weighting calculations, I understood that this was somehow going to affect the way we have, so how many pupils are in the district and versus what school choices they make, and that that was changing the way our funding um, future looked? Um, I guess I'm not, <laughs> I'm not following. I think what she's asking is that before it's about the resident pupil right, units right. versus the mm -hmm. adjusted, mm -hmm. and oh, yes, there is a that. there is a change in that piece. That is a component that is changing um, for the referendum correct. calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. yep. 
Yes, they did switch that. Um, and that is part of, you know, they've said that for fiscal year 14, 15, it'll, there'll be a hold harmless, okay. basically. So it's 15, 16, and we need to start to look at that. Yep, mm -hmm. um, and we, we basically don't know at this mm -hmm. point um, okay. how that's going to shake out. Um, hopefully we'll have better information. I wondered um, if that was still, you know, if that made 15, 16 look you know, be anticipated it might look worse than we're seeing, or I mean, it's all always been that year that we've had to watch things. But I think yep, I at this point don't have anything related to that in okay. it, just because there's not um, good data yet on what exactly that's going to mean for mm -hmm. us. Um, but we do obviously have several kids that go out, um, mm -hmm. you know, out of the district, which will be significant. Um, so we will be doing more analysis on that. And I think when we learned, uh, when we went to several of the meetings after the legislative session ended in June, and then the next month, essentially, the department trying to figure out what the legislature did, um, I do think there's actually still, com still some components that they are still trying to operationalize. There were some immediate things with things like location rec uh, equity revenue, mm -hmm. which we talked that they had an immediate need to figure out by September. Right. I believe there are some other things we're still getting some guidance on. Okay. Anything else? Thank you so much, Val. Okay, I do have one more thing, um, just kind of a, a side note. She's um, jobs done. What? She's got one more thing. <laughs> yes, I am, I'm here um, on behalf of Paul Bell. Um, so we just wanted to let you know, um, just for your information, that we have a um, capital facility bond that's getting paid off um, tomorrow, actually. And in our capital plan, we have um, some roofing needs and so we have planned to just basically renew that. Um, it, there's no effect to the taxpayers. It comes out of our operating capital revenue. Um, and we have plans to keep the payment exactly the same as it has been for the last 10 years. Um, but you know, we know that you guys don't want to make a decision on information you heard that night on a multi-million dollar <laughs> um, project. So we did, um, we have um, submitted to MDE for the review and comment. Um, which we will hopefully hear about in the next week or so, um, whether or not we've been approved for that. So we will likely come at the February meeting um, asking for approval to move forward with those bonds. Um, we're looking at approximately a million and a half, um, and they will be to do the roofs for Greenville Park, um, the M&D wing of the high school, um, and depending on how much funding we have available, um, potentially the parking lot for Greenville Park, um, mm -hmm. repaving that. So um, that's once you guys um, give us the approval, if you choose to do so, we have a 30 day window where as they call it a reverse referendum period where the public basically um, would need 15% um, of the registered voters to petition to say, no, we can't do it. Um, and if that does not happen, then it's officially approved. Um, but due to the timelines of going out for bids and um, it's taken MD their full 60 days that they have to come back to us. Um, we are kind of running up against some timelines to get, um, you know, a contractor in place and that sort of thing for the work to be done. And we know that if we can do it earlier, we can um, potentially have some really significant discounts in the pricing. Um, so we just wanted to give you that heads up because we would likely bring it to you for approval um, and not just information next time. So um, if you guys have any questions about that, um, I'd be happy to address them now, otherwise um, we can talk in more detail. We were hoping we might have an MDE review and comment for you even tonight, but it just it's taking them the full time to do it. And all of the projects that Val is talking about are pieces that are part of the 10-year plan. They're things that have been forecasted for a long time. We have several other of these roof bonds essentially that are in place, a couple of others. Um, that we plan to continue to turn over. It's again trying to be good stewards of our buildings. What we know is if we don't do that, what's going to happen is you get in a situation where you have a whole bunch of roofs with problems at one time. Uh, this district over the last decade has been excellent about taking care of those things in a timely fashion as to not cause a greater financial burden to the public when something actually goes completely awry. And one of the things that um, Director of Buildings and Grounds Paul Bell has been doing, we've been trying to push the capital process back even further. So we used to, even on our other capital projects, used to start talking about that in March. We started that in December this year because what we know is that it's becoming so competitive that if we can be some of the first out with our projects, 
we have a much greater chance of getting discounts. In fact, if we are able to start some things even before the school year is out, there's a significant discount in areas where it makes sense. So we wish we had something for you tonight, but we're in a waiting game. But we do want to be able to move forward, so we just wanted to share with you what those plans were. And I think from an historical perspective, and I'm trying to think, Noel, you were on the board. Carrie, I think you were on the board at the time. Um, this was a strategy that we looked at almost a decade ago as we looked at the major cost of roofing replacement and the idea that by uh, issuing this type of bond to get that piece done and that we were able to make sure that we would continue to get roofs uh, repaired and upgraded and replaced on a regular basis. That was that pro process allowed us to do the new roofing that we put on before the hailstorm uh, that actually su survived the hailstorm with no damage whatsoever. Um, but I, you know, the, the idea with this is uh, this it just continues as an ongoing uh, effort because with the amount of square feet we have under roof, if we aren't constantly looking at maintaining and replacing, we will come to a point where we need more than a million dollars. We'll need many millions of dollars just to do roofs. And this seems to be the, the again, the much better, much more st uh, stewardly way of uh, trying to focus and make sure that we have the dollars to get this to happen. So this is not a new approach, not something different than what we've done before. We're just simply asking for the continuation of that as now we have bonds that are are going to be paid off and we're ready to move forward for the next step. <coughs> Questions? We were looking deep in thought, so I was just checking. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Val. Thank you. All right. We are ready to move on to our first item for individual action, which is the facility <coughs> study. And I would just, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Matt because he and Paul did the, the lion's share of work with this piece. Again, remember that this is kind of the um, third part of the, the discussion that we've, we've had in terms of saying that we knew we needed to make some short-term modifications to address the kindergarten needs. Number two, we wanted to do the, the enrollment projection and work there. But the third piece is, and combined with the enrollment projection, we really felt the need to do this comprehensive facility study. And so um, the information that Matt's going to share with you will be about the process we went through and the uh, people that gave us quotes and the recommendation we'd like to give you uh, for moving forward with that facility study. So as you're aware, we put out a what I would consider a really comprehensive request for companies to provide us with a proposal for a long-range facility study. And as I mentioned at the meeting last month, we were extremely clear that there are no building projects in our immediate future, but what we wanted was an honest and holistic appraisal of our buildings, our facilities, our grounds, not only from a serviceability perspective or a lifespan perspective, but also from their ability to meet the changing requirements for um, a progressive education, which I think we would all agree we're trying to provide here. Uh, we had on January 2nd, which is probably one of the only days in January, it wasn't totally crazy uh, weather-wise, uh, we did do a walkthrough and invited companies uh, to come to that. Two of the three companies who ended up providing a quotation for us uh, came to that meeting. We had a, quite a lengthy discussion with them. We're really fortunate the three companies that provided quotes for us are uh, really rock stars of Minnesota K-12 architectural firms. Uh, we had ATSNR, which is a very large firm out of the Twin Cities uh, that has done a tremendous amount of work throughout the state. Both Dr. Richardson, um, Director Mary Hansen, and I uh, have worked with them at various points in terms of our careers on building projects. TSP, another uh, project, uh, one of their lead people I had worked with extensively in our Bell Plain building project in a previous district. And INS uh, is a company that does a lot of work in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa, and they have a number of um, really great exemplars of their work uh, in the southern part of the state. So we really had three outstanding companies that provided quotations. All of them, uh, according to Paul Bell, 
have in their proposals have met the requirements that we've asked for these folks to look at so no one is saying we'll do this you know but we won't do this they've they've met the base criteria of what we're looking for and essentially we had some interesting quotes because the quotes range between ninety five hundred dollars and thirty four thousand um, dollars not totally unexpected in the fact that this kind of study if it's attached to a referendum in some districts would be done for free so if we had said, you know, hey, you know, we're a district where we know we're growing significantly, we know some kind of building project is going to be the case, a company may throw this, you know, throw in the facility study as to try to sweeten the deal uh, to be able to have them as the architectural firm for your building project. So what we saw is, um, and in talking with ATSNR, who is the what we call the lowest responsible quotation, they're very aware of the um, level of service that we're asking for. They understand that there's no uh, immediate building project or any kind of plans for any kind of piece at this point uh, but they believe that they have the ability to do this and this is what they are willing to do it for <coughs> frankly I do think that they're hoping that if something comes out in Northfield down the line that um, the lower quotation that they provided provided for us would um, encourage us to take a stronger look at them uh, so we had one at 9500 one at around 27,000 and then in the top at 34,000 so in going through, and, and again, these are folks that we worked with on the kitchen project. ATSNR actually had helped us with our kitchen project, which might have helped because they've already done some analysis of some of our facilities. Our recommendation to you is that we use the ATSNR firm um, to do this comprehensive long-range facility study. And we have the utmost confidence that they can provide what you have asked us to provide you. The other thing is then that they, their study will also dovetail and be with the demographic connected study, yeah. with the enrollment projection study and the housing study because a big part of what we want to see come out of this is for them to look at the serviceability and the long-term use of our buildings given what enrollments are going to be up to 10 years into the future. And we're going to want to look at all of the different programs that we're currently running. So not only will we look at our existing buildings, but we'll also look at the community services program, which is currently housed in the NCRC, and we'll be looking at all of those pieces in terms of how best to have those fit together. Um, and I, again, I just see this as a really important piece for the board to have as you kind of think about the long-term future of our school district, having that enrollment projection piece in place, having this facility study in place, I think that points us in the right direction to make some of those long-term decisions which again are all about stewardship of the community's dollars and the community's facilities. I do think the other piece too, um, you know, personal experience of having worked in districts where the facilities uh, became outdated uh, significantly to a point where there were certainly some student safety issues and those kinds of pieces. I think the advantage of where we're at right now, where we know our enrollment has been relatively stable, what we have a chance is to really look into the future to make some informed decisions. In my previous districts, when we had an issue with facilities, it was on fire then. And if we weren't able to get something done, it was really a disservice to students. We're not in that position. We're not even close to that position. So the fact that we are able to, again, from a position of strength, look out, dovetail it with the, with the demographic and the housing projection study, we think that we can be ahead of the game and anticipating what those needs might be rather than reacting and we all know when we can be proactive we're in a much better position than when we're in reactive so we really do think this is it is the right time to look at something like this so board members i recognize you may have questions or comments but um i since this is an item for individual action i would like to hear a motion on the table first move approve. moved by john to uh, support the superintendent's recommendations for the ATSNR to complete the facility study at a cost not to exceed $9,500. Seconded by no. Questions or comments? Julie? Um, I just appreciated the fact that you provided us with all three um, mm -hmm. to be able to read through them. I thought it was really interesting. Um, what I really liked about ATSNR was um, that 98% of their business is has been schooled and the fact that you guys have a, a track record with them. And I think uh, what they continue to emphasize is how the facility really have to tie in with emerging curriculum trends, emerging technology. I mean, they really get that, that it's a very integral relationship. And um, so I really appreciated that about their proposal. And I also thought that their um, 
references were really detailed and, and really good references mm -hmm. of people talking specifically about how they had um, worked successfully for them. So um, clearly they are a very good choice. And, and the other two good. vendors are fine mm -hmm. architectural firms as well with mm -hmm. great K-12. We, we couldn't go wrong with any, frankly, any of the three we couldn't go wrong with. I think been happy with any of the three. you got it. In this case, it's looking at are we getting the same service and what's the lowest responsible quotation? Other comments? We have a motion and a second on the table to support the superintendent's recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right, we are ready to move on to our second item, um, and which is the school year calendar. And there is two on the table, the 2014-2015 school year calendar is one item and then the proposed staff makeup day is a second item so why don't we start with the the 2014-15 school year calendar okay. that would be fine and again in the materials you have you've got a uh, a background uh, document for your review uh, which is titled proposed calendar makeup day modification 2013-14 and 2014-15 uh, and again we'd like to just go through that with you quickly and then uh, Matt and I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the, the potential to need to think a little bit more about uh, what happens if this happens to be that year. Then maybe in 25 years is kind of off the charts. Uh, but let's first of all take a look at kind of what we think are the is the core. Um, Again, what we know is, is over the, the last few years, basically, we have operated with calendars that ha had some built-in time. Again, as, as you remember, at 174 days, we tend to have more days than many other districts in our area and around the state. Uh, and typically, when we've missed a day or two, we've really not looked at trying to require makeup days, especially for those first two days. You also remember the, the joys of May the 2nd of last year when we had a snowstorm that in part of our district dumped two inches of snow, another part of our district dumped 17 inches of snow and caused us to have a third closing day. And really we chose not to try to make up the day at that time simply because it was so late in the year, our ability to really impact that was, was uh, really difficult unless we simply were adding days at the end of the year, which really would not have any uh, positive impact for kids. Um, at that time, uh, those of you that were on the uh, negotiations committee with teachers, remember that uh, we discussed and modified the contract language because the current language was antiquated, went back probably to the time when the contract was first written. Uh, and at that time, we basically said uh, that uh, in modifying that language that any days lost beyond the first two days could be subject to being made up. Uh, and at that time we discussed identifying possible days that could be converted um, and because we knew that that was also something that we needed to do. However, also with the negotiations, we already had a calendar in place for the 2013-14 year. Once we got done and shared that calendar with you at the last meeting in, in items for information, uh, we became aware of the fact that there was a memorandum of understanding that had been in place since 1995. Um, nobody had really seen it, it had not surfaced in that time, but it, we did find actually sign, a signed copy of that particular memorandum. And basically what it indicated was that um, as a trade-off for expanding the number of days in the contract, because in 94, we only had 185 uh, teacher contract days. In the 95-97 contract, we moved to 187 uh, contract days. So the MOU basically said as quid pro quo for expanding the number of days, uh, there was a desire by the teachers that 
the teacher work days that were traditionally at the beginning or end of the of the uh, quarter or semester could not be changed to student contact days. Well, if you remember the calendar that we shared with you a couple weeks ago, we looked at the idea of trying to change the um, work days at the end of the of the third quarter to a student contact day if we had for 1450 yeah, for 1450 if we had a weather situation uh, obviously when this mou was brought up and we reviewed it with the association it was clear that that was not an option for us so what we have looked at is thinking about creatively how to make sure that we could expand the number of student contact days if we had multiple days off because of weather and but also then not to uh, violate the MOU which um, unlike most MOUs that we write now which typically last the length of the existing contract this MOU basically was in <coughs> perpetuity there was no change and could not would not or could not be changed unless you went through the negotiated process to do so and it was the trade-off for the and it, again that was that trade-off for the 185 to 187 days so what we're bringing to you tonight and on the on the next page is the actual uh, proposed contract that we have for you for 2014-15 and what you'll notice is that we have uh, done some modification for the end of the first semester and the second semester and that is uh, we now no longer have a work day at the actual fiscal end of the first semester but because the MOU allows it to be in reasonable proximity to the end of the semester the idea would, would be that we would keep the MLK birthday as the teacher work day uh, and then that we would move the other day that traditionally would have been on the 26th of January we moved to the 16th of February, which is Washington's birthday. And John, you should be perking up at this point. Uh, the idea being that if we don't have a snow day or don't have a day when, when we have to call off school, there would be a teacher work day, that, but there would be a no student contact day on the 16th of February. If, however, we do have a um, snow day that occurs before the, uh, or on or before the 13th of February. And that's three press rubber. Right, after after three snow, three snow days. Then we would make up that third snow day on the 16th of February. If we don't have something before then, with the current calendar that we have, we really have no other ability to reinsert a day unless we choose to try to go in and and either take the beginning or the end of the spring break. And I think our discussions as we've tried to work through that would be if we were trying to use the 23rd or the 27th of March, we would have an extremely difficult time making that work. So the other thing that we looked at with this calendar, and again, uh, we did meet with the association, let's see, that was a week ago, Friday. Friday. Uh, the other day that we looked at for this 2014-15 calendar was to add also June the 8th as a possible teacher to make up work day on that day. So in other words, if we did not reach um, three days of uh, snow or ice or cold uh, time off, then uh, we would not use that. But if we did and it was after the um, 13th of February, then there would be a teacher make up work day on that 8th of June. So the, again, the, the concept here is that for this calendar, that gives us the ability to have a, an additional student makeup day and also to do a, a, an additional teacher makeup work day in the 2014-15 calendar. Now, the other thing is those of you that have worked on the calendar with me over the years know that this calendar um, will be, I think we probably will be moving toward the last calendar for a while that is going to be structurally such that it's difficult to try to reduce the length of the winter break. Mm -hmm. Simply because of when the actual <coughs> Christmas holiday and when the actual New Year's holiday is. In another year, 
it's very likely that we will be able to shorten the winter break, which means we can add more days on the first semester. We can shorten uh, and reduce the, the days in June before we're at the end of the contract and contact year. And at that point then, if we were looking at building days in, we could actually build days in at some point during the, the calendar year for 2015-16, or we could actually create days in that first week of June. That just is not possible in the 2014-15 year, unless our choice is to go in and try to manipulate the spring break, which we honestly do not feel is going to be in anybody's best interest at this point and extremely difficult mm -hmm. on our families. So that's the proposal at this point for 1415 is looking at a calendar again that, that very much does the pieces that were under uh, the description of district interest. Uh, it has the 174 contact days. It has uh, an 87 day first semester and 87 day second semester and it has uh, one additional uh, makeup day for students if uh, the snow days exceed three uh, in the 2014-15 uh, year and one additional day for teachers if we are not uh, at three days or beyond uh, before the um, 13th of February. Now hopefully that's clear as mud at this point but that's basically the kind of the calendar discussion that, that we've had. And again, what, what we'd like to do if we can tonight is to get you to consider the approval of, of this piece as it is. And then what we'd like to do is share with you uh, just some thinking that Matt and I have had over the last few days, just as we're looking at the number of physical days off we have already, um, the significant pressure that seems to be occurring when blocks of, of districts choose to close as a block uh, and thinking about what might happen if we were out with six or seven days out and also looking at though the, the reality of what that really is in terms of our statutory need to make up days because this this is not about a statutory need to make up days this is about what what should we do for kids if we get out into that range of many days of, of uh, loss of school. So questions about the 2014-15 calendar as proposed. Before we get into discussion, because this is an item for individual action, if I could ask for a motion. So moved. Moved by John to support the superintendent's recommendation for the 2014-2015 school year calendar. Seconded by Carrie. Questions? John? I have a question just in terms of, of procedure here because this is different from the calendar that we looked at last time. Is that, I mean, is there a requirement that we're to publish the calendar before we approve it? No. And, and, and actually, I mean, it, in all in all intents and purposes it has been published because it was in the board agenda it was part of the board packet it was not in the table file but the other thing john is the reality is when you look at the change the only real change in this is the movement of the 26th day being a 26th of january being a uh, work day at the end of the year and moving that uh, work day back to the 19th which already was a day off for students and adding a, um, a no school for students day on the 16th which is President's Day uh, so it is a, it's a very clean and very minor change from what we presented at the last meeting. And I'm glad to finally want the President's Day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and you know if there's serendipity to this the one really positive thing that has been a concern we have heard from parents for a number of years mm -hmm. is that the people come back from winter break and then they go to school a week or two and then they're off on a Monday and then they're off on the next Monday. This actually spreads that those breaks out between the two months and, and really gives us the ability to kind of address that February date if we don't have snowmageddon 
or the ice monster or whatever we might be looking at. So you're saying I was right all along. Thank you for that. It, it, <laughs> it, if that's how you want to perceive that, that's fine. Are there questions? Julie? So, so if I understand this correctly, if we were to have a snowstorm on the 12th or 13th of February and that were to be the third day, then we say, oh, you get to come to school on Monday. Correct. And teaching staff, most other staff would be there. The only folks that would not be there that we would need to ask to cut to be back would be EAs and food service. And, the, and, 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 and again, that date is a possibility is the key thing. You know, we've not yeah. identified um, days for weather before, and that's part of this process is trying to be really transparent about this is a day, but in, under certain conditions, it may convert to a student contact day. I think we also are a long weekend in, yeah. in, in the Bahamas or whatever because you might have to be back on the 16th. And again, we felt that was much better than trying to take a chunk off the beginning or the end of spring break, no. knowing that we would have a significant number of folks that would have already planned. There's there's no way you're going to you're going to impact that. So we were trying to look at a date that if if there was a day off for, for snow, you know, even up to the 13th, it, it would seem to be a natural jump to come back on the 16th and make that happen. Um, the other thing is it avoids probably the other thing I've seen over my career that we've seen some districts do, that is come back on a Saturday, mm -hmm. which I have also would suggest to you is not a not a good strategy. You will, you will not get good attendance. You'll get a lot of pushback and um, the impact in terms of it being a quality of instruction. Where my sense is, if, if we're gone before the, the 16th of February for a third day, coming back on the 16th is going to is not going to be in any way um, a less usable instructional day than any other day we'd have at that point. Julie? Yeah. No, clearly that that is the best. Other questions or comments? All right, we have a motion and a second on the table to support the superintendent's recommendation for the 2014-2015 calendar. All those in favor of approving, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. School calendar is approved. The next um, item within there is the looking at the 2013-2014 staff makeup day. Great. And again, there's just a couple of bullets here under the, in the document that we shared with you. Obviously, the master agreement was finalized after the 2013-14 calendar was approved. We really did not build any additional makeup days in beyond the days that are in the calendar. Um, and so we know our options for this current year are extremely limited. Uh, we want to share with you what we think is kind of the most likely scenario in terms of what might happen and then we want to come back and look at kind of the, the Armageddon uh, scenario in terms of, of going forward for both years. Uh, but what we're proposing here would be that the board would approve adding a makeup day for <coughs> teachers on June 9th should we end up with a total of four days um, out for snow. Full day cancellation. So, uh, and again, not two hour late starts because we still get a, a day in when we do a, a two hour late start, but we've already lost two days, the sixth and the seventh. So we would lose two more days, so we'd have four days reduction in terms of the calendar. Then uh, the makeup day for teachers would be to come back on June the 9th. And again, we discussed this with the association at the time we were discussing the 2014-15 and I believe we had consensus from them that they were comfortable with doing that piece. So it, it, it gives us a way to at least address a piece of that and, and uh, uh, again um, is not the best situation because we're already deep into the 2013-14 calendar but it does give us an opportunity to uh, address at least a makeup day in terms of the teacher contract. All right. 
So um, before we have questions, I would ask for a motion um, on the table. I move. Moved by Noel to support the superintendent's recommendation for the proposed 2013-2014 staff makeup day. Second. Seconded by Julie. Questions? I had one comment that I know that um, Carrie and I, when we were at the meet and confer, I heard that for elementary teachers, it sounds like the being able to, if that were to happen and they came in that Monday, that that in some ways might help with some of their whole checklist that they have to go through. Although I understand that we're also modernizing, yeah, making that, modernizing, that, modernizing that as well. The checklist, but yeah, yeah I'm, my sense is there would be a lot of elementary teachers that would be just fine with it as the makeup day because um, they like the many of them like the idea of having more time to spread out to get the not only the check in but also room arranged, things put away, all the other things that are part of that elementary teacher's life in their classroom. And I appreciate you sharing the Minnesota statutes with us. I thought that was really helpful. There's no questions or comments. All those in favor of approving the superintendent's recommendation for in the event of um, two more days this calendar year that we would have a um, staff makeup day on June 9th. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now right. what I'd like to do is take a look at, and uh, Matt did a very, very lovely job of being able to try to capture all the things that he and I have been brainstorming over the past few days. Um, and again, I would share with you, first of all, the information that's on the second page, which is the Minnesota statute. I, you know, because I, there are lots of people who are looking at this and going, well, why don't you make up every day? And, or, you know, well, maybe we shouldn't make up any days or, or whatever. I think it is important for you to understand that, you know, in, in Minnesota, there are some statutory requirements both in hours and in days. In hours, it's 1,020 in grades 7 through 12. It's 935 and 1 through 6. It's 425 for kindergarten students. When we look at the number of hours we have, as I said, we have one of the longer years and one of the longer days uh, of, in districts. So when you do the math of 174 days, it's six and a half hours, which is seven hours minus a half an hour for lunch we have 1131 hours if we take out the 36 hours for plc's we're still at 1095 and remember the number of hours you need at most for the for the even for the high school is only 1020. so even with the two days we've done which is 13 hours and the, and the one two hour late start that we had which now is going to be two <laughs> as of tomorrow we still will have 1078 hours with 1,020 being the required number. In days, again, we're not even close. The, right now, the state requires at least 165 days of school. We're at 174 normally. We missed two full days, so we're at 172. So this is really not about meeting statutory requirements. What it is about is thinking about at what point uh, in our next two calendars, do we need to trigger more than a single makeup day, either for teachers or for students? And so what we've tried to do is to share with you um, the brainstorming we've done about this and trying to think about where this might go. And I think this is really triggered from the idea that as we look at, well, I think Rochester is probably our poster child now. Rochester's at five days yeah, five gone already, <laughs> and that isn't the it isn't the end of January yet. The metro, almost all the metro schools are four days out, including tomorrow, for which most of the metro schools have closed for the day. So you know, when we start thinking about that number of days, we're really starting to we're talking about more than a couple. And if you think about it, over the last decade we have had either zero or one or two days the entire time I've been here except for last year. Last year we were three. The year before I came to Nita, I think we checked back 
we also had three days that year. But over the last 20 some years, it typically has been zero or one or two. So when we start seeing situations where we start seeing this many days this early on, and knowing that we have a full another at least three months of winter, um, I think we were concerned and we thought, well, we may need to come back and think about this. So what we'd like to do is, is in this piece, is is not necessarily ask for your vote tonight, but we will ask your consideration and also any dialogue and thoughts that you have about this. What we're really looking at here is saying for 2013-14, we know how difficult it's going to be because we're already into the calendar, we're already just finished negotiations, we're trying to do those pieces. But what we're suggesting here is if we would move out to uh, beyond the, the four days, we already have set up the um, the idea that we w would have a makeup day if we got to, to four. But then if we get out to five, we are saying, wouldn't it be appropriate at that point to have two teacher workshop days at the end of the year? And at that point, we'd really do some rethinking about the kinds of programming we might provide for teachers at that time. We might actually try to do some things that were more than simply work time for teachers because we would have uh, an audience of all the teaching staff that we could really take a look at. And that might be looking at technology, it might be looking at PLC work, it might be looking at um, a number of other kinds of pieces that might make some real sense to do when we know we have an entire staff to work with. I think if we get to six days, given what we've always talked about, which is saying we really need three days in a week to make it really work well, at that point, what we're asking you to do some thinking about and consideration would be at that point that would actually trigger moving from teacher workshop workshop days to moving to student contact days and what we do is actually move the finals and the final week into the week of the 9th 10th and 11th which would actually give kids more time to prepare they would regain some of the loss in the second semester there really might be some logic at that point to doing that. Our sense is if we're below that, it probably makes more sense to try to work with teachers because I think if we're asking kids to come back for one day the next week or two days the next week, we see that as problematic. Not impossible, but I think that's something we would want to think through. So that's kind of our thought for 2013-14 is you know, we're not making up days with, with day two, which is where we are right now, or even with day three. But day four, we have teacher workshop day makeup. Day five, a second teacher workshop day makeup. And with day six, we modify or move from teacher workshop days to having that be three contact days and really shift the second semester calendar to put finals and all those other activities into the last week of school. Then for 2014-15, where now we have a little bit of um, advance notice and advance warning, uh, we'd be looking at instead of waiting till we got to day four, when we get to day three, if it's on or before the 13th, we look at, at converting that, which is, is what you've already approved. If the third day is after uh, you've already approved, approved the idea that there would be a teacher workshop day on the 8th, which would be the, the Monday of the, of the first day of the, of the second week of June. And then what we look at is going out to day four and five and having that be um, teacher workshop days. But if we go again to day six, <coughs> then we would look at basically putting in three student contact days on the 8th, 9th, and 10th and then follow up with a teacher work day on the 11th. So we would actually extend out the length of the school year. We'd basically uh, be saying to staff up front that you can expect if we get into that kind of a, a, a mode where we're looking at six days out, that we would actually be looking at trying to get those days made up. And we'd be saying that to parents yet this year in terms of that piece. 
So those, that's kind of the, the thinking we had. And, and um, as I said, we're not asking you to approve that tonight, but we are asking for your advice and your thoughts about this, because obviously this is the first time you've seen this. Uh, it really takes us a significant step beyond where we've gone before, but I'm just really concerned that with the shifting weather patterns and with shifting issues that we're seeing in terms of weather, and frankly, uh, issues in terms of how people are even perceiving weather, uh, in terms of, of what does constitute a day that we shouldn't have school, that it is very likely in the future that we're going to see more and more days that for whatever reason people are saying, and the district is making a decision not to have school. And I think at that point we need to be thinking about at what point is that trigger we really, you know, make up significant numbers of contact days at the end of the year. If there's a downside to this, and again, it's the downside that in this, this two-year period, really about the only place we can make the adjustment other than in 14-15 when we can add the day on the 16th of February, is that we're talking about days at the end of the year, which are probably more beneficial for secondary because it is time to prepare for finals but it, it is totally after all the MCA testing. It's after the majority of assessments that kids are taking, whether that's MCAs or NWEAs or any of the other pieces. So it is not as beneficial as building it into the calendar. And what I guess we are saying to you is beginning in 2015-16, when we have the potential to adjust the winter break, we'll probably be coming back and trying to put more of those makeup days into the calendar because I think at that point then we can get them in for the high, they're the highest impact. These are not the best days to get back, but I think when you get to the point of saying you missed six days of school, we need to really be thinking about how do we address that. And again, we did not recommend coming in on Saturdays, which you, I mean, you could do. I've seen it happen. And as long as you don't have more than five days in a week, you can do that. But we think this maybe is a, a more reasonable way to address it. And it, it would give us, in either case, we bring this back to have you talk about it again next time, we'd be able to give people a fairly significant warning about the fact that that potential is out there. Thoughts? Because this one, this one is not an easy one. This was a tough one. Right. <clears throat> I just have a question for clarification. The reason you'd be adding teacher workshop days is, is to fill up the 187 contract days. To, to move us closer to at least uh, recapturing those contract days that are lost. Because we're already you're saying that the first two days, there is no recapture at all. So we're, we're basically saying for the first two days, that there that doesn't happen but again if we're getting beyond three days this year or two days next year our sense is that we need to think about how can we appropriately recapture some of that work time yeah exactly so there's two separate things there's the 174 student contact days and 187 Correct. teacher contract days and Correct. you can you have more flexibility with the second number because you can add teacher workshop days more easily. Well, the, the thing is there, it, then you're basically talking to and working with staff and saying, you have a commitment to provide us with X number of contract days. If you've not fulfilled that, we can ask for those to be made up. As soon as you try to add back student contact days, then you have to work with a, the community in terms of saying what, you know, what's a workable way to get those days back. And as I said, you know, the idea of Saturday is not a good idea. The idea of saying let's go into the, to the spring break and, and cutting two or three days out of the spring break and having people come back after you know what we'll hear, which is I've already got vacation planned, I've got tickets bought, we're going somewhere, uh, all the other things that are absolutely appropriate and reasonable because we've given people a year to think about that. 
seems difficult. Now, I know, and Danita, again, you and Noel probably the only two there. I know there was a time when we did not have a spring break. But that's a long time ago. <laughs> and I would also say, I remember what, that. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sabertooth tigers still did roam the earth at that point. But but I also know the districts that have, have tried to do that after having a spring break have found it extremely difficult because people have now kind of built that into their okay. routine. And I think in this community especially with the number of people that are used to having that kind of traditional spring break piece it makes it even more and more, di more difficult to do that during that block of time and if you talk to our principals they will say that the thing they love about the spring break is it's at the end of the cold and flu season and it gives them to get everybody out and clear it up and come back healthy and fresh especially at the petri dish you yes, know in our elementary petri school. dish the level with the elementary other questions? Carrie? Well, I, I just uh, kind of a logistical. The idea is that we'd come back and we would approve this game plan for the, if we had the five, six. Yeah, that, that if we, and really if we're into Snowmageddon in either of the next yeah. two years. Yeah. Okay, so, so we'd have this in place. I mean, this board in the next month or so would put this in place for the next couple so, of months. So yeah. we would ha again have time to say to both staff yeah. and to students, you know, this isn't happening for four months, yeah. but you know, if we have a whole bunch of, of additional days off, then we're going to do something more than yeah. just say, oh, that's nice, we're not having to do school yeah. okay. for another four days. And it could turn 40 degrees later this week and be that way through. I hope so. We hope so, but. I, 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 I will get out of my Hawaiian shirt. Uh, <laughs> I think we also work really well from a plan. You know, and over the last, if you remember years ago, school districts would build in snow days, you know, and then we didn't have many for years and people said, oh, we don't really need them anymore. And I think what happens is when we have years like this, our biggest um, enemy is not the right word, but adversary is ambiguity. Yeah. And if we can put together a template that we can utilize moving forward, I think our folks are focused on student instruction and, and doing what's right for kids. And if we have something that's in place that people can look at and say, oh, those are the rules of the game. People can live with it. It's when we're trying to make decisions after the fact that sometimes the apple cart can become a little upset, which is fair. And again, I, my sense is if you come back to us in a couple of weeks after having a chance to chew on this or talk to people or whatever, and you guys say, Chris, you are absolutely out of your mind, I'm fine. I'm okay with that. You know, But I, I just think it's important to at least put it out on the table for us to consider because I do know that if you talk to people in the community, you're going to have some people are going to say, no, it's fine if, if, if this is act of God, then, then you know, let's not make it up. We have other people that I think would like us to make up every single day that we miss. And so I guess um, if this is anything, it is probably a compromise which means I think by definition nobody likes it very well but it, at least it, it I think addresses the idea that there comes a, a tipping point when you really do need to begin addressing uh, teacher contract days and student <coughs> days. Here, or Julie um, I just said one point of clarification I'm yes. assuming that graduation date would stay the same yeah, we, we don't see any way in the world to shift yeah. that because you're, you're never going to know. <laughs> you know, you're, you just, you're never going to know <laughs> until it would be too late <laughs> I just want to, to clarify. Change. No, I just, <laughs> oh, graduation uh, is the same. He's laughing. We, uh, we know better. Short of a snow day. Okay. We, we know I just better. wanted to clarify. Unless we have a snow day. I guess in, unless we have a snow day at the end of May. So. June 1st. Oh, June 1st. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Over French 5. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. So, Appreciate you willing to be willing, willing to listen to our thinking on this. It just is something that has been more disconcerting, especially as we've kind of seen how the, these kind of rolling closures have occurred in the last few, especially where 
we have seen either a single district that starts the ball and then a whole bunch of districts follow, or where now we've now seen some of our uh, meteorologists, especially our TV meteorologists, begin to talk directly to superintendents on the, on the tube going, <laughs> I know all the superintendents are be going to be closing school, you know, and why haven't they closed school yet? And I bet they'll have made decisions by four o'clock in the afternoon, which would never be the time we normally would do this. But just just being aware, there's some philosophical and some uh, societal changes that are also occurring in terms of how people are thinking about mm -hmm. the whole issue. So. Thank you. All right. We are ready to move on to our third item for individual action, which is uh, a motion or a superintendent's recommendation um, to cancel the March 24th school board meeting because it falls on during spring break. And um, unless we need to do a makeup. Yes, unless we need to do. It. <laughs> we can come back in June. <laughs> Um, I guess before we have any questions on that, I would ask for a motion on the table. I move. Moved by Noel. Seconded by Ann to approve the superintendent's recommendation to cancel the March 24th regular school board meeting. Questions or comments? No, Dr. Richardson and I did talk about um, things coming up and we thought that we would be able to manage the agenda so that that shouldn't be a problem, at least from what we can see. Mm -hmm. All right, if there's no questions. All those in favor of approving the motion to cancel the March 24th school board meeting, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are ready to move on to the items in the consent grouping. I'll remind board members that there were a number of items in your table file, personnel appointments, and designations that were added. Um, is there anything anyone wishes to pull from the consent grouping? I would ask for a motion to approve the consent grouping. Moved by John. Second. Seconded by Ann. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The consent grouping is approved. Items for information. In your packet, you will have saw the school board committee appointments. I would thank board members for giving me their input and for serving um, on these committees. It's really important, um, all the work that these subcommittees do, so I appreciate everybody's willingness to, to take on those appointments. Uh, future board meetings. We have February 10th and February 24th. And with that, I would ask for a motion for adjournment. Moved we'll we'll by Noel. Second. Oh, second by Julie. All those in favor, in favor of adjourning the meeting, say aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting is adjourned.